So uh, let me uh, just say we're very happy to have Andrea Schindler here to give us this talk. Um, so Andrea, you may recognize he comes around once in a while. We have uh, his affiliation here. His home base is in Hawking. Uh, he also has a joint employment town on campus. And most interestingly, though, he's, he's what he's going to tell us about today, which is uh, some, uh, a new strategy for going after nuclear structure. Okay. Yeah. So let me just let me get sure. into it. Well, thank you. I'm very glad to open this uh, season of uh, HIT seminars. Uh, so today, what I'm going to talk about is a, is a new method to determine part of distribution functions from lattice QCD. And the first half of the talk, I will describe the method. And then in the second half, I will show you some preliminary mega results using this method and uh, trying to calculate the part of distribution function of the value as a starting point. So, I just have to click your slide again or something. Okay, so the method I'm going to use, I don't think I need the pointers, I can use the finger, but so, so the method I'm going to use is called the gradient flow. Uh, oh, I'm using the old, old oh. version. Okay, oh, much better. Okay. So the method I'm going to use is the gradient flow. Now, I, I don't pretend to explain the gradient flow, what, what the gradient flow is to the non experts, but at least you have, a, you have an idea of why we are using it and why, why it's so yeah. useful in this type of calculations. So the flow essentially is a differential equation that fields have to satisfy. So this is the differential equation that defines uh, the gradient flow. You see the initial condition is the gauge field in this case, SUM, uh, but you can write down the gradient flow equations for other theories. And then the field is evolved uh, in, a, in a new scale, a new variable is called T, flow time, uh, which is a dimension of minus two, so it's actually a surface. And, um, and on the right hand side, you see the covariant derivative of the field tensor. And uh, as a matter of fact, the right hand side is nothing else than the variation of the action of the classical action with respect to the flow fields. Okay. Uh, one can envision building other type of flows, but this is what we are going to use. Okay, so D are the covariant derivatives with the respect to, to the to the joint representation and they are calculated uh, with the flow fields. Now the what the flow does, to understand what the flow does, is a good idea to start at, uh, at three levels. So you switch off the interaction, and you end up essentially with the heat equation. With, but on, on the right hand side, you have the four-dimensional Laplacian. And so you can solve it with the heat kernel. And the solution is given by the convolution of the initial condition and, and your heat kernel. And the heat kernel, due to the structure of the equation, is nothing else than the Gaussian. So the result of this, equa of this equation is to provide a Gaussian dumping, a large momentum, as you can see from here but also to provide some smoothing, a short distance over a range, which is of the order of square root of AT, because T is a surface, square root of T is a, is a length, okay? The most important property that we're going to use uh, is the fact that one can show that once this uh, uh, flow time is fixed and positive is finite, any correlation function that involves flowed fields does not uh, require additional renormalization. In other words, the continuum limit of this field is finite when you insert it in the correlation function. Now, one can imagine uh, uh, building a gradient flow equation also for the fermions. Again, this is one possible version of this equation. And you see on the, on the left-hand side, again, you have the first derivative respect to flow time. And on the right-hand side, you have, again, the Laplacian, but this time it's the covariant Laplacian. Okay, but the derivative now respect to the fundamental representation. And the initial conditions are the two fields, psi and psi bar. And again, the flow time is dimension uh, minus two, it's a surface. For the fermion fields, the, the solution, uh, when you switch off the interaction, can be obtained in the same way. In fact, the kernel is exactly the same as a Gaussian. And the effect of the, of the gradient flow equation is identical. Namely, it provides a, a smoothing of a distance, which is of the order of square root of AT of the field. But it also provide, uh, provides a Gaussian dumping at large momentum for the field. Now, the only difference between the fermion gradient flow and the gauge uh, gradient flow at this point uh, is that while the gauge fields do not require extra normalization, they don't add any extra UV divergences to the theory, uh, this is not true anymore for fermions. Namely, fermions need to, need to be renormalized. But the biggest advantage of using float fermion fields is that any bilinear or any N, N fermion operator renormalizes only with the fermion content. Namely, any bilinear renormalizes always in the same way. Any four fermion operator renormalizes always in the same way. 
And it's just the appropriate power of this renormalization factor here. The reason for this essentially is because the flow time provides an additional cutoff to the theory and it removes all the short distance singularities of this field. And so the only normalization you have to take care of is the normalization of this, like the normalization of the wave function. Okay. As a consequence of this, for example, you take the condensate, which is, uh, let's say, psi bar psi. Now, if you use a, a physical cutoff, like the lattice spacing, these objects under normalization can mix with lower dimensional operators and they become very difficult okay, to deal on the lattice. You see, for example, and in the case of the gradient flow, if you take the, the, the scalar, the scalar field at a non-zero flow time, this object renormalizes multiplicatively and somehow the short distance singularity and the power divergence is completely removed. Okay, so this is a summary. There are no added divergences when you consider flow the uh, gauge invariant uh, fields made of uh, fermion fields. And the continuum limit is finite after normalizing the fermion fields appropriately. Okay? Okay. Good. And it does not depend on action. No, this result is, is true for any. You have to flow with the continuum. Any, any, th this result is true for any, any regulator. Does not depend, in fact, it's true also in EMS bar. So you can, but in EMS bar, you have no, in EMS bar, there are, there are no power divergences. So that's kind of move. But on the lattice, also, there are no, uh, there will be power divergences, but there are none, and it renormalizes multiple. So the, one could envision, many ways to renormalize the flowed fields. If I will just spend one slide in, uh, because there is one particular interesting way to do this. In practice, we don't even use it uh, numerically, but I, I, needed to, I needed the scheme to do the perturbative calculation. So this is just really technicality. But one possible way to normalize the flowed field is to normalize correlation functions with expectation values of the D slash operator. Okay? Namely, you define uh, some, something called uh, ring fields, with, which are fine, uh, which are renormalized and finite fermion fields, uh, and they are defined in such a way that the expectation value of this slash is one over t squared. This object is dimension four, and this is dimension four. Okay? So this is just a renormalization condition for the ring fields. The reason why this expectation value is convenient is because you can calculate easily this both on the lattice and in perturbation theory, for example, in dimensional regularization. So this object is an opportunity definition of the flow of fermion fields in the regularization independent way. Uh, keep in mind that when t equals zero, obviously this object makes no sense. This makes sense only a positive flow time. Now, we, defining the, the ring fields in this way, you can calculate the change of scheme between this scheme, for example, and the MS, on so the MS bar. And this is known up to next to next leading order. But just to give you an idea, at next leading order, you obtain uh, the the change of scheme, you, you obtain it in this way. So, so mu is, is, this, is the normalization scale, you see the flow time, and then you see this finite part. This finite part, uh, the log of 432, shows up all the time, a little bit like the order gamma 4 pi in, in, the MS, in the MS and the MS bar. Okay? Uh, so if you choose the ring fields, this constant will, will show up. OK, so the strategy we, we, we follow is the following. Given the renormalization property of flow fields, uh, uh, what we try to do is to calculate some finite correlation function on the lattice and non-zero flow time. And then, of course, we need to understand how to then compute the physical matrix elements, which are the one at zero flow time. And to do this, you use an asymptotic expansion it's called short flow time expansion. And, uh, and you calculate these matching coefficients in perturbation theory. And then uh, inverting this relation, you can calculate the renormalized matrix element at zero flow time. Keep in mind that the scheme that you use to calculate the matching coefficient would be the same scheme that you obtain, would be the, the final scheme of this matrix element, because this object should be independent of the scheme you choose to factorize to do this uh, short flow time expansion. Now, these matching coefficients are calculable in perturbation theory only if the dimension of this object and this object is at least the same, okay? Because then the corrections are logarithmic. But if, for example, this object uh, receives contribution from lower dimensional operators, then you have some power divergences in the flow time, and then this object you better calculate non perturbatively on the lattice. Uh, okay. This does not concern this quantity in particular. Now, this idea has been used in the last, I've, I've been using it in the last 10 years to attack the problem of uh, CPO operators that contribute to the neutron EDM. But as you will see, the same strategy appropriately, uh, uh, you know, the general idea can be used also for this, for this quantity. Okay. So, again, this is just a summary of what I just told you. 
So again, strategy, you calculate the left-hand side, you do the continuum limit, and then you invert this relation knowing what are the matching coefficients. So this is the paper I submitted some time ago and that has been accepted for, for, for publication. And this is the, is the method I'm going to describe in this uh, the first, the, let's say 15, 20 minutes, okay? Okay, first some motivation. I don't think I have to motivate the study of pattern distribution functions here, but just to remind you that uh, the PDF uncertainty is still one of the largest sources of uncertainty affecting the prediction of the x cross introduction. This, in fact, is the plot that was produced by the LHC x cross section working group. And then you see this blue band represents the uncertainty stemming from, it, uh, from the PDF and the strong coupling as a function of the collider energy. But the PDF contributed also to the extraction of standard model parameters like the strong coupling and, and the W mass. Okay? But maybe most importantly is that because the PDF uncertainty becomes rather large at uh, large Bjork and X, uh, they might affect uh, all, all the analysis which aim to, to, to try to find indirect uh, new, physic, uh, new physics evidences. Okay? So what's the story between pattern distribution functions and the lattice? The story uh, goes back some, some years ago, okay? In principle, the connection between PDF and hadronic matrix elements, which are the things that you can calculate on the lattice, is achieved uh, th through the moments of the PDF. So the moment, as you will see, the moments of the PDF are directly related to hadronic matrix elements. Okay. So this means that th the lattice can provide, in principle, uh, a means for the complete reconstruction because you know if I calculate enough enough moments, I can reconstruct the full PDF. Now this possibility has, has essentially remained impractical because there are both theoretical and numerical challenges which are associated to the calculation of the high moments. Okay, and I will try to summarize this. Uh, but namely, the continuum limit becomes really too difficult for n larger than three. So essentially, you are constrained to do to x x squared and x cubed. Additionally, for n2 and 3, for x squared and x cubed, you need some non-vanishing external momenta to somehow help you out with the renormalization problem. And this degrades the signal-to-noise ratio. Now, the situation has been nicely summarized some years ago in a review by Christoph and, uh, and Marta, where they state the following. Realistically, only the lowest moments of PDF and GPDs can be computed due to large gauge noise in high moments and also unavoidable power diversion mixing with other dimensional operators. Now, the combination of the two prevents a reliable and accurate calculation of the moments beyond the second or third, and the reconstruction of the PDF becomes unrealistic. Okay. That's, that was the situation. Okay. And that was the state of the art for the pion, which we will compare them later on. Okay. So the, uh, there's been other approaches, namely trying to circumvent the problem of calculating the moments of the PDF, but rather trying to calculate directly the full PDF. Huh? And there is a list of methods which I'm not going to review, okay? And, uh, and these methods, they, they are all more or less based on, on, a, on similar ideas, but they allow in principle an indirect determination of the moments because once you have the full PDF, <coughs> you can of course directly calculate what are the moments of the PDF, okay? An interesting idea uh, was essentially put forward uh, around 10 years ago, okay? Which was the idea to try to, in order to calculate directly the moments, was to try to find a way to recover the rotational symmetry before doing the continuum limit because that was the problem, essentially, okay? And while this method has not been applied numerically, uh, it's, uh, I think it was, uh, it was uh, an idea in the right direction. Okay. okay. Now, the method that I'm going to discuss addresses both the theoretical and numerical challenges that have been faced in the past. And so I will show you that, in fact, the moments can be calculated directly, even beyond the x squared, x cubed, and so on. And just to show you an example of the kind of situation you can end up trying to reconstruct the PDF from the lattice directly, <coughs> here you see a calculation of DTMC. And you see that, for example, the PDF here for the, for the, for the valence quark, are, have, they have even have the wrong sign, okay? So the reconstruction of the full PDF with this type of, in this case, this was using a quasi-PDF, I believe. Uh, the reconstruction is not, is not an easy, I mean, the calculation is not easy, okay? Okay. <coughs> so I will, I will now discuss the method that I propose and that makes, uh, tries to uh, calculate the moments of any order. Now, let me remind you, these are uh, so-called twist two operators. Please interrupt me if you have any questions because I have to uh, condense in 15 minutes lots of, lots of information. So, good. so that th these are so-called twist two operators, okay? They have operators which have one gamma and a set of covalent derivatives. And these are the operators 
which are directly related to the moments of the PDF. And this bracket here you see between Lorentz indices means symmetrization over the Lorentz indices. Okay. Now, in principle, one tries to calculate the matrix element of these operators on the lattice, but because now on the lattice the rotational group is broken, okay, into the hypercubic group, uh, something uh, not really nice happens, namely that the reducible representation of the continuum group, if you will be in a continuum, become, become reducible under, uh, under the hypercubic group on the lattice. This induces some unwanted mixings between generalization. In particular, there are the reps of H4 that contain operators of different dimensions, and so they allow mixing with lower dimensional operators, and it even complicates the mixing with operators of the same dimension. This is a fact that not many people talk about, but there is also this fact to take into account. I'll give you an example, and perhaps the best example comes from the operator uh, uh, with three Lorentz indices. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me go with this operator. So let's say that you choose the three indices to be the same. Okay, if, you do the, if you do the calculation, you will discover this, this object as a power divergence, like one of y squared. And this power divergence, in fact, is not, is not even recovered in the continuum. This object is, not, is, is, is there because um, you're breaking off for symmetry on the lattice. Okay, so there is, there is no way to, to, to cancel that once you do the continuum, unless you explicitly subtract that, that divergence. So you have to calculate the coefficient of this guy. One way out would be to choose two indices to be different and, and, and two to be the same. Okay? And so, if, for example, if you choose this object, 4, 1, minus 4, 3, 3, it was noticed a long time ago that, in fact, this object uh, renormalizes both multiplicatively, and so it has, it has no power divergence. The reason why it has no power divergence, you can see in two ways. One is that this, in fact, belongs to one of the reps of H4. Okay? But an, another way to see it is that these two objects have, in fact, the same power divergence. And so when you do the subtraction, they can, the power divergence cancels out. Another possibility would be to choose uh, three different indices. And then in this case, with three different indices, there is no mixing. And so this object renormalizes multiply. The disadvantage of these two last options is that in, in this case, you have to inject a non-zero non, a, a non spatial momentum in the correlation function to do the calculation. And in this one, you, you have to insert two different uh, Two different momenta in two different directions if you want to calculate the, uh, the matrix element. And every time you inject the momentum in, in this type of correlation function, the noise increases. Okay? So in order to avoid the problem with the normalization, you increase the gauge noise of the correlator. Okay. Now, if you try to go beyond this, uh, at, at n equal 4 is still possible. But then if you go beyond n equal 4, so beyond x cube, this, in practical, this, this problem is, is unavoidable. You cannot find any combination of Lorentz indices that that remove this type of power divergence. So the strategy is the following now, in order to try to solve this problem. You calculate first the matrix element of the flow that twists two fields. Okay? And as I've shown you at the very beginning, these objects, in fact, do not have any, any power divergences. They just renormalize in the simplest possible way. They renormalize like a bilinear, okay? because they have two fermion fields. Now, you can try to renormalize the fermion fields, or you can build appropriate ratios, which have two fermion fields in the denominator and two fermion fields in the denominator. In the ratio, the normalization cancels out. So these ratios are finite in the continuum limit. And then what, what, what you have to do, you have to construct now fields which are based on the representation of the continuum theory. Because at finite flow time, I can do the continuum limit. I don't have to worry about my, my irrep under the hypercubic group. I can just do the continuum limit. After I've done the continuum limit, I can use a, a basis that, that belong to any rep of A4 and, uh, and, and do the matching with the perturbative factors that I just shown you, that I shown you earlier. And in that case, because now you are in the continuum, the matching is multiplicative, like, you've been, like, like it happens in the continuum. Okay. So this is a, it's a slide to try to, to remind myself uh, that, uh, how, how it works to build O4 irreducible representations. If you, find that, if you find that boring, I can skip it. But the idea is that you build the tensor, which is an irrep of the, of the linear group uh, in four dimension, uh, which is essentially the all the matrices which are invertible. Okay? And then this is, this, is a, this is a group, and you, you, you sum of all possible permutation on indices, and this, and this becomes an irrep of, of GL4. Now, if you want to irrep of the orthogonal group, uh, there is another operation that, in fact, commutes with a symmetry operation, which is the contraction of two indices. Okay? And so what you notice is that the subspace of all the traceless tensors are invariant under O4. And so it, 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 I can always decompose a tensor as a traceless part plus some trace terms. Okay? 
And so any rep of this group is going to be any, any triceps operator, which is closed under a group operation. So I, I, build, I take my tensor, I subtract all the possible traces. This object belongs to any rep of O4. Okay? And that's what I'm going to construct. OK, so I have to construct traceless operators on the, in the continuum. Uh, did I say we had traceless and symmetrized rank and tensors are a reusable representation of O4? OK. So, Andre, can I ask a really naive question? Sure. I'm just trying to think about this from the point of view of similar problems that show up in non relativistic physics that we know how to handle. For example, it's a nuclear structure, you, you break symmetries all the time. And, and in the rotational models, for example, you completely break the rotational symmetry. But what you do there is you just apply the rotation group to, I mean, the rotation operator uh, to the state that you break and restore the symmetry. So why is there not some real simple, simple step like that that you can take here as well? Because you are, you're on the lattice. So you, if, you for, if you forget the flow time, you're on the lattice. And so you would have to do the same kind of objects, but for H4, for the upper cubic group. And so if you don't do that, then uh, quantum corrections would generate for you because the symmetry is broken and some, some power divergences. That's what's happening. Makes sense. If, as a matter of fact, you can see the applying the gradient flow as an intermediate regulator that allows you first to recover the symmetry. That's what you're doing. First, you recover the symmetry because then you still have to do the extrapolation to zero flow time. But there, at that point, you can do it with the continuum symmetry. That's the whole idea. Okay. So, in order to apply the strategy that I described, uh, the uh, the missing ingredient is the calculation of the matching coefficients. So the coefficients that bring you from the matrix element at positive flow time to the matrix element at zero flow time, which corresponds to the moments of the PDF. Okay. And so now I now I remind you that this object is the, now is the flow the uh, two, these are the tower of twist two operators containing now flow fields, both fermions and the gauge fields in the covalent derivatives. And this object, as I told you, renormalizes multiplicatively because it contains two fermions. So it, it renormalizes like any bilinear. So you can define this object normalizing with these slashes. So if you wish, dividing this correlator with this, uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this object here and imposing that this expectation value is one is proportional to one over t squared. Okay. This, is, this is the scheme I've used the, in, the, in the perturbative calculation. But as, as you will see, numerically, it might be advantageous to do something else, but I will get, I will get there. So, but this is the scheme I've used in the perturbative calculation. So once you have now renormalized the fermion fields in this way, uh, you do the you take a, any rep of O4. So you consider the, the traceless operator. You see here, is that this is the this is the twist two operator minus the trace terms, and then the, this object, uh, the expectation value of this object is proportional to the average x, the moments of the PDF. Okay, and I can do this for any n. There is no restriction in the order. This is true for any n. Okay, and the matching between this this operator and the one at t equals zero is in fact uh, multiplicatively as far as I choose uh, this uh, uh, irrep of O4. Okay, so now I have to calculate these matching coefficients. Okay, so I repeat the strategy. You take your flow twist two field, you renormalize it in your favorite way, you build the, your irrep of O4, you calculate the matrix element, then you perform the matching with these two matching coefficients that you can calculate in perturbation theory, and you determine. The, tweet, the, the moments of the PDF in the, in the scheme that you have used to calculate the matching coefficients. So, okay. Sure. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Sure. The thing is, uh, how is it, um, you have to take the continuum from the first law. I mean, how do you get rid of either divergences or you mentioned earlier, and how do you, well, how do you avoid the, yeah, so for, with the lower dimension? So yeah, so first you have to do the continuum to. limit of the flow. Uh, so this matrix element here between the flow the operator and the, and the hadron state, this you calculate in a standard way using three point functions. So you, you have your hadron interpolator, your, your flow, the twist to operator, and the other hadron interpolator. You do a standard three point function right. analysis. You extract this matrix element, and now this matrix element depends on the flow time. Yeah. Yeah. Now, for each flow time, you do the continuum limit. So you do the continuum limit at fixed flow time. At that point, you just have a continuum curve that describes the flow time dependence of this matrix element. There are no, no, no extra divergences because this has been removed, renormalizing the flow. The, the flow. In, a, in their terms, which are, you know, this is like one over T or log T. They, they are subtracted because, you, because, oh. because you automatically, because you are choosing a traceless, you're choosing an irreparable form. So there are no one over okay. T. 
they are subtracted. In fact, we see them numerically. <laughs> once you choose, uh, once you choose the rep of O4, uh, the power divergence in the flow time are subtracted automatically for any n. That's one of the key points of the method. Yeah. Okay. So the calculation of the matching coefficient is done uh, in a usual way. So you, you probe the operator with some external unflowed quarks. Okay, and then you do you do the, I don't know if you, some of you are familiar with how to calculate matching coefficients, but what you usually do, you expand all the integrands, um, and all the scales, excluding the flow time. Okay, this will distort the infrastructure of the of the Feynman diagram. Okay, but because on the right hand side you expand in all scales uh, and uh, there is no additional scale, the, all the Feynman integrals are zero in, in, in dimensional regularization. For example, this means that uh, the infrared structure, the, somehow the infrared poles uh, that you obtain on the left hand side uh, would have to match the, the UV pole that you obtain on the right hand side, and so you can read off immediately. From the from the pole and the log structure on the left hand side, the matching coefficient. And in fact, we can discuss how this is done, but uh, essentially this is this is how you do it. Okay. So you, you calculate at this point at one loop the matching coefficient, calculating this Feynman diagrams in this in, in the way I just described. The Feynman rules are slightly different uh, from the usual Feynman rules, and the reason is because because you have flowed fields here. Okay, so this this operator now is flowed, so you have extra diagram because I have to describe the the evolution of the fields with respect to the flow time. Okay, but these are known, and even though there are some a little bit of extra Feynman rules and Feynman, and Feynman diagrams, calculation are actually rather not too difficult. And nowadays we have the technology to go to to, to loops to next to next within order with this type of calculations. So now, uh, in order to uh, okay, so at one loop, I've done the calculation at one loop at this object, and the, the structure of the result is as follows: you have a log with a coefficient. Okay, and the finite part. Now the coefficient of this log, because in the way they are defined, in fact, has to match the one loop anomalous dimension of the twisted operators that was written by Rosser Pilchik in their famous paper about asymptotically free theories. Um, okay, and then uh, there is a finite part, which is, uh, which is, let's say, the new, this is, if you wish, it's a check of the calculation. And, and then there is a finite part, which is the new result of the calculation that for n equal two, so when you have two Lorentz indices, so gamma mu d mu, if you wish, uh, for n equal two, th that operator uh, it's, it gives the fermionic contributions to the energy momentum tensor. And this calculation was already done some years ago. And in fact, for n equal two, I reproduce the result. But this is generic for any n. Okay. okay. Now, one technicality for lattice practitioners is that one has to worry also about cutoff effects when you do the calculations. So one should check, uh, one should try to understand what kind of discretization errors one obtains in these calculations. And again, in the in the standard twist two matrix element calculation that you see here, oh, there is a two missing here. Yeah. Uh, beside the order A, the, the linear, the linearly dependent lattice spaces and cutoff effects, which comes from the lattice theory for example, or, or day square, depending on the lattice action you're choosing. There are also specific cut of effects that depend on the operator. And if you use, for example, clover type fermions, which are a very popular lattice action used nowadays and relatively cheap to simulate to compare with the principal Wilson fermions, for example, uh, then these operators have order A contributions, which are different for any N. And to my knowledge, they're known only to N equal two, okay? And only in perturbation theory. This means that if you want to use uh, some clover type of uh, ensemble or lattice action in your simulation, you would have to face not only the problem with the renormalization, but also the problem with rather large cut of effects as soon as you go for n larger than two. Okay, for n equal three or n equal four, we don't know what are the coefficients of these uh, order A effects. Okay? The solution would be at that point only to use Ginsburg fer fermions or to use Wilson twisted mass and maximal twist, okay? which, which removes this order A. There is also VTMC I've shown you earlier obtained with the twisted mass. Now, if you now use this method to calculate the uh, moments of the PDF, you are calculating this matrix element here. Okay. Now, it turns out that if you do an analysis a la Zimancic, of these of these correlators, you will find out that beside the standard or the, the standard cut of effects that you have in the corresponding lattice theory, uh, you have two type of additional order A effects. One which are um, uh, order AM. Okay. 
And then there is another one, which I don't think I mentioned here, which has some sort of short distance uh, cutoff effects, but they should not appear, they do not appear when you calculate this type of matrix L. They appear only when the operators are close to each other. That's just not the case. Okay. So for example, one can imagine to try to, to calculate ratios of moments, okay? And uh, this, these ratios have a double advantage. The first advantage is that uh, this uh, renormalization of the flow of fields uh, cancel out in this ratio. And additional, both the order AM and this uh, short distance uh, singularity I just, I just uh, mentioned, it should also vanish, meaning that these type of ratios of correlation functions should be finite and should have a continuum limit, which is order improved. So there are no order A cut of effects, only order A squared. And this is true no matter what lattice action you use. Okay, it doesn't matter. So in other words, if you improve, of course, if you use Wilson fermions, you would have order A from the Wilson. But if you use Clover fermions, for example, or some variant of the clover fermions, which is the one we are using, uh, then these ratios have cutoff effects, which are about a squared. Okay. okay, so let me resummarize the strategy. Okay, you, one calculates this adronic matrix element, which is calculated on the lattice using standard techniques, calculating three point functions. And from this one reads off from the reduced matrix element, the moments of the PDF, the flow, what we call the flawed moments of the PDF. Then one use the, the matching equation to reconstruct the, all the moments in, in the scheme that you prefer, ms or ms bar. Okay? And the matching is multiplicative for any n. And so, for example, if you want to calculate x cube, one possibility would, would be to choose uh, an operator which, have all, which has all the four indices to be the same. Okay? The problem that I mentioned before is completely wiped out. It doesn't exist anymore. And this object now, will have a finite continual, this matrix element of this guy will have a finite continual limit and will have a multiplicative matching, which is given by this factor I just showed you earlier. Okay. Now, the advantage of this operator now is that uh, it automatically solves the second problem, which is the one of the signal to noise, because to calculate this matrix element, you don't need any external momentum. So you don't have to inject momentum. If you don't need to inject momentum, the correlator is actually less, uh, is, uh, is way less noisy than, than if you would inject momentum. So in the end, the strategy will be the following. One calculate ratios of correlation functions, uh, let's say x squared over x or x cubed over x. One does the matching and using perturbation theory with the matching factor I just showed you. And the only input that one needs is average x at the given renormalization scale in the same scheme, okay? So since average x is in fact a standard, uh, by now is a, is a rather standard calculation on the lattice because average x does not suffer for all the problems that I've shown you earlier, just if you go beyond average x. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. You have the, uh, the angular 4 case. You have a, besides 444, 4, 4, you have a alpha alpha 4, 4. Uh, would they involve any moment other directions or not? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, you have also special directions. Yes, you do. You have a zero moment? It doesn't matter because you are, you are, this, this would be non-zero. And this object, you have it there just to remove the power divergence. The power divergence is there also, even if the momentum is zero. So, okay, so, okay, so uh, here you have all the indices, including the spatial ones. And the, and the traceless combination is there to guarantee you that this object has no one over t or one over, uh, in this case, one over t divergence, yes. Yeah, the same thing as like, uh, you know, Martinelli is a t zero. So in that case, you have a t well, it's not the same. Because, one third. It's not the same because they don't have the flow time. So uh, yeah, I know. We're just saying that the subtraction. No, no. Again, it's not the same because they use a representation of the upper cubic group, but this is a representation of O four, and they cannot choose the four indices to be the same because there will be no there will be no way for them to subtract their power divergence. They have to inject the momentum. I don't no, have to. Uh, it's, it's, no, it's, you, you can look at t zero zero, but you have to subtract this. Yeah, but you can't. You would have to do it, uh, you'd have to calculate non perturbatively the, the coefficient of the one over squared separately. There is no symmetry that connects the two. Uh, anyway. No, no, yeah, you, okay. you really can't. <laughs> no, so, otherwise, people would have done it, right? You really can't. So, uh, you, in that case, you would have a one over, let's take n equal three, the example I showed you earlier, okay? There, you cannot choose four, four, four. Because no, there is no subtraction that you can cook up that will actually remove the one of i squared divergence because you don't have a symmetry that, that helps you to do that. Well, we did this way, but just a linear, just x momentum. X, x is, is different. Second, the second order, uh, just the second moment, x, x. x is zero, zero. X is one derivative. And it does, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it has, if you choose four, four, x has no power divergence. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
that's, so that's not that's, that's not I'm a problem. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is the strategy. I hope you, uh, if you have questions about the strategy, let me know. <laughs> and uh, so we try to test this uh, numerically, and this is done in collaboration with this gentleman here. And as you see, uh, most of them, I think you know them. <laughs> and in particular, I want to uh, well. <laughs> okay, uh, so. Actually, <laughs> Sorry, you're right. Sorry, I apologize. I hope I don't get fired now. Um, uh, sorry, uh, gentle person. Okay. Yeah. So this is really bad. Okay. So the calculations are done both on per matter here and in joules, the portion set from English. And uh, the strategy that we want to follow is the following: uh, we calculate partial distribution functions from lattice QCD. First, we start doing the continuum limit of the pion at the unphysical. Uh, point where all the three light quarks up down the straight jar uh, have the same mass. It, it corresponds to a pseudo-scalar mass of around 400 MeV. The reason to do this is because it's easier to generate gauge configurations at this point and we can do the continuum limit. Then the second step would do the, to do, to do the uh, calculation on the pion PDF at the physical point, and then uh, eventually to move to the nucleon, where of course the problem will be uh, more difficult because of the signal to noise uh, of the nucleon itself. So this project, in fact, part of, uh, of uh, Open Lat. So Open Lat is an open science initiative okay, that uh, uh, aims to calculate uh, to, to generate gauge configurations using something called stabilized with some fermions. I really don't want to go into the technical details. It's just some choice of lattice action and simulation algorithm uh, to generate these gauges. Here you have uh, a plot that shows the um, uh, in, in terms of, um, of volume, mass, and lattice space in the ensembles that we are calculating. And so you, we have one, two, three, four, five. And we are going to use the, the four between 0.12 to 0.264 for Fermi. And we use this point here where all the, all the pseudoscalar are, are at around 400 MeV pion. And in this, in this, uh, with this ensemble, we can do the continuum limit. And uh, as I said, this is uh, it's calculations which are done thanks to the support of NERSC and to the support of Praise and now Euro HPC. Uh, there is a big contribution coming from a French machine to generate the gauge configurations. And as I told you, the calculation of the average X is done on the partially in NERSC and partially in the machine in Eurish uh, in Germany. Okay, so let me show you some results. Uh, so this is, uh, these are, this is uh, the, uh, the float x squared over x for pions. I put in quotation in, uh, you know, it's not really pions because up, down, strange are the generated, the pseudo, the pseudo scale of mesons. Okay, so we have four lattice spacings. We have a volume which is over the three Fermi beside the point of 77, which is a little larger. Uh, the, this is the sourcing separation between uh, the two, the two pions. And, and we take uh, the value of the matrix element in the center, so at, uh, at, as far as possible. As far as possible from the source and the sink of the triple factor. So, uh, so this is something uh, source and sink is 40 lattice points, and we take the value of the matrix element at 20, the maximum distance between the source and the sink. Okay. The statistic that we choose that we have is here one corresponds to the number of sources, so the number of times that we invert the core propagators, and these are the number of gauge configurations, which are all of the order of 200 for these lattice spacings, and we have slightly less statistics for 0.12. Uh, the reason is that we are still check, we are still doing some sanity checks of this ensemble here. So we pick the gauges that we are more confident, um, which, which we are more confident. Um, these are the results. Uh, uh, blue is 0 0.12, and then you see green is 0 0.094, purple is 0 0.077, and yellow is 0 0.064. Um, and these are, this is the flow time dependence, okay? And this is the x squared over x before I do the matching. Okay, there is no perturbative matching, and this is just the results as, as they come out from the lattice simulation and, uh, and uh, plotted as a function of the flow time. Now, if I do the perturbative matching, uh, this, you will, the plot will change, but all the scales will stay the same. This is what happens. Okay, I do the perturbative matching with the formula I showed you earlier. Okay, and again, this is, the, this is 0.12, and then you see 0 0.94, 0 0.077, and 0 0.064. 0 .064. Okay, so there are several comments to make here. Uh, the first comment is that you see some non-monotonic behavior between 0.12 and the other lattice spacings. Uh, this is most likely related either to these uh, sanity checks that this ensemble still has to pass, perhaps, okay? Or perhaps it's just an indicator that this lattice spacing is too coarse for this type of calculation, okay? 
In fact, if I remove this lattice spacing and I look at the three finest lattice spacing, uh, you see that there, is a very, there are very small cutoff effects and they will be very easy to do the continuum limit for any flow time between 0 0.7, 0 0.8 to up to, up to three, essentially, okay? So this means I will be able to follow the flow time dependence of this object on a, on a very wide range. And because I, additionally, you will see, you see that there is a very tiny slope in T. This is not unexpected. And the reason is that when you do the short flow time expansion, the matching takes care of making sure that the extrapolation to T equals zero is safe. So you extrapolate to the right value. But you might have contribution from, contributions from higher dimensional operators that come with powers of T. Okay, but you see that in this ratio, these contributions are very small and can be easily extrapolated to T equals zero. So once you do the continuum limit, you can extrapolate to T equals zero you obtain the results of x squared of x. Now, this uh, band that you might not see, there is a gray band, uh, corresponds to the uh, state-of-the-art calculation for this quantity done by TMC. Okay, and I want, to, you know, I want you to compare the statistics of this, of, of this calculation. So th this calculation, the ETMC calculation, is done with almost 4,000 gauge configurations. We use a factor 20 less. Okay, this is one lattice spacing. Okay. And they, they get the statistical error, which is 20, uh, a relative statistical error, which is of the order, uh, around 27%. This is the band. Okay. While us uh, with the statistic, which is 20 less, uh, 20 gauges, uh, uh, gauges, 20 times less, uh, we get the precision, which is the order of 1 or 2%. Okay. So this means that if you will be able to do the continuum limit and then the extrapolation with this with this type of statistics, most likely we will have a sub percent precision for average x squared. Okay, we are talking about average x, average squared. This means most likely that the precision of this object is might be in the end dominated by the precision with which we can use to calculate average x. So we'd have to try to push a very precise calculation of average x. Okay, with any method, it doesn't have to be the flow; it can be a Raman. The mean that is trying is actually doing this calculation. So, but uh, yeah. there are two, there are two reasons. There are two reasons. One is that one. So one, the flow smoothens out uh, the short distance fluctuation. So it helps in reducing noise. But also, as I said earlier, x squared in this calculation has no external momentum. Uh -huh. They have. They need at least one or two. I think, I think actually in this case, they have two external momentum to the calculator. Yeah. Okay. There's a, there's, a, there's a PDF calculation from Markov. I think it would be a good precision. But uh, calculation using direct calculation or trying to reconstruct the PDF? Uh, the, the computer PDF and then construct the PDF. Yeah, no, I'm comparing just with direct calculation because that's the same thing we are doing. So. But uh, when when we will have the final, the final when we will do the final analysis, we will take into account also kind of indirect calculations at the moment so using the reconstruction of PDF. But there you see those type of calculations have a, a whole different set of potential systematics. It would bring me to discuss these extra systematics they might have. So that here I'm just I'm just comparing the the, the, the statistical uncertainty with this gray band. Uh, the the red data point here. Um, is uh, an additional systematic that they have due to the excited state contamination. Okay. And keep in mind, that one should also keep in mind that they have a, a slightly lighter pion, 260. Okay. We have a relatively heavier pion, around 400. And so, you know, when you go to lighter pion, the statistical uncertainty might increase also for us. So there is also this factor that plays a little But you know, between 260 and 400, I mean, we are talking about a factor of 20 in statistics and a factor of 10 in, uh, so, I mean, the difference is huge. Okay. Do you really need to that many points in the T? For this study, it's fine. But the future, when you consider it, so in principle, in principle, in principle no, you, you you made a good point. Uh, so in principle, in principle, no. But before you do the simulations, you don't really know. Okay. In fact, there is another uh, there is another piece of information that might be useful. So here with these arrows here, I'm I'm trying to describe essentially the largest, maybe the largest uh, size of the operator once you flow it. Okay. And because the, the operator is done, uh, the operator contains covariant derivatives, x contains one derivative, x squared contains two derivatives, x cubed contains three derivatives, and so on. This becomes objects on the lattice, which becomes larger and larger. Okay. And, uh, but when you do the continuum limit, they become, they become ultra-local again. And so the green point represents the size of this operator 
at this lattice spacing, and the yellow corresponds to the to the size of the operator at the finest lattice spacing. You see that you know once you cut the, somehow the flow time dependence a little bit after, you know, if you go a little bit beyond the size of the operator, you have cutoff effects well under control. If you go a too short distance, you will probe the you know the granularity of your operator, and so you expect large cutoff effects. In fact, we observe them. So. Okay. Okay, so this is X cube. Situation is the same. The simulation parameters are the same. The statistics is the same. And these are the results before the matching. Okay. And uh, also, let me emphasize one thing. In principle, one do not would do, do not need the matching through the continuum limit. One could do the continuum limit at this level. Okay. And and then do the matching afterwards. It's just for, for uh, presentational purposes. Okay. So this is the result after you have done the matching. Okay. The blue points are again uh, the point 0.12, and then you see the green point 0.94, point 0.77, point 0.64, and you see again some uh, non-monotonic behavior in the lattice spacing. As, as I said, this is not too unexpected, and you see also that uh, the coarser lattice spacing uh, starts to bend earlier than the other points, and this is simply an effect to the, at this lattice spacing, the operator has this size, more or less, and so you're starting to feel the cutoff effects due to the size of the operator. If you go to final lattice spacing, this effect disappears, and you see that at 0.064, uh, essentially the flow time is practically flat. This will happen, but it will happen much, much later. Okay. Okay. So if I now remove uh, the, the, the course of the, the course of lattice spacing, uh, you see that I can do a rather safely a continuum limit here if I want to. And again, this is the comparison with X cube calculated by, by GNC. And you see that the relative uncertainty with around 9,000 uh, 9, uh, data points is around 75%. This is this band here. While for us, uh, with a statistic which is a factor of 20 smaller, we get the precision which goes between 3 to 5 or three to, no, 5 to 10%. Okay, so you can imagine that if we increase our statistic by factor 40, you can, again, you can see that most likely X cube will be dominated by the uncertainty of average X and not by X cube itself. Okay. Is there any meaning in the fact that you systematically buff the red result for both x squared? Uh, the, the one other reason why there could be is because uh, uh, this is 260 and this oh. is 400. And the average x is known to have a rather, a, a, a not too strong, but a slight higher mass dependence coming from above. That's uh, most likely what's happening. Yeah. But keep in mind, yeah. For, so for, <coughs> So they're not really, you cannot compare the numbers one, one to one because, of, because the pion masses are different. Okay? Mm -hmm. But if you do the continuum limit of this guy, okay, the point is that our data will be uh, maybe 10, 10, 20 times more precise than this number, but you know, statistically they're kind of consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah but, that's, I mean, <laughs> but that if you are systematically above it, so the statistics are I think, I think, I think you're right. I think it's, 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 it's just the effect of the pion yeah. mass. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, because the error pi mass, the, the partners become more like a valid snag. So That's right. That's right. It's, yeah, That's right. It's okay, so this is XQ. And this is if you remove the, the course of lattice spacing. Again, the comparison. Okay. And now, uh, okay, so this again, sorry, this is a, maybe if you're interested in this piece of information. So the green is again the size of the operator for this lattice spacing. Okay, and the, and the yellow is the size of the operator for 0.064. As I said, the operator becomes more and more local when you do the continuum limit, but you see that you know when, when the data reach somehow more or less the size of the operator, you start to see these large cutoff effects that bring the data down. Okay. Okay, so this now is x to the four. Okay. Okay, so this is x to the four. These are the unmatched results. Okay, and uh, let me show you the matched ones. So these are the matched ones. You see now, uh, uh, the cutoff effects now seem to become uh, monotonic. Uh, one should not be, we will try, we'll try to understand this, but one should not be too surprised because the order A square effects uh, of these correlation functions do not only depend on the theory, depend only on the, also on the operator. So it could, it could very well be that one of the matrix elements of, of the higher dimensional operators in the semantic description of the cutoff effects uh, might have a different sign compared with the other ones, and this would flip the cutoff effects. There is no... There is no theorem that says that they have to be monotonic for every x. Okay, but nevertheless, you see again here that we, if I remove uh, if I remove the course of lattice spacing, I can do a, a rather safe continuum limit because this is 0.077, this is 0.094, and you see that 
in this region here, between one, 1 1.2, let's say, to up to three, I mean, most, I have a very, again, a very smooth, uh, very smooth dependence on the flow time, meaning that once I will be able to do the continuum limit, I can do safely continue, um, a T equals zero extrapolation. And you see the signal is pretty good. I mean, take into account, again, these are 200 gauges. If we want to push this by increasing the statistics by a factor 20, uh, we can expect at least a factor three or four reduction in the total error. Okay. Is it meaningful for X cubed uh, to, to the force to be negative? I mean, if I extrapolate this by I, I go negative for this. No, 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 you have to extrapolate in the opposite direction. See? 0 0.94 for 70 cents, you have to go up. But I take the yellow points and I go with T to zero. That's the extrapolation. Yeah, continue. Yeah, yeah, but first you do the continuum limit. Yeah, right. So okay. if you do the continuum limit, I don't know if this slope is negative or positive. Okay. It should, it better okay. be, you, better right. be flat or positive. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You don't want to have it negative, right? I mean, that would make sure no, no, that, that, that something is wrong. No, something right? is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there may be some operator leak same. Some what? Operated no, no, this object is multiplicative. I know, no, I know, yeah. I know, I know. Ah, I see what you mean. Uh, you know, okay, so I, I see, I, um, yes, I, I accept that. So we, we would have to understand if the subtraction, when you subtract the trace term, we would have to monitor the subtraction to the trace term. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, if I, by the way, I mean, this object to me it becomes becomes flat, I mean, at least. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, you, you, you see it up here. I and mean, these are cut of effects, but here there are almost none between these two of them. No, but you have to do the continuum limit. Yeah, 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 sure. And also, <laughs> and also the, the arrow, if, if, uh, if Andrea put this arrow again, so you are close to the, to the boundary and you, you get more. Oh, you mean, you mean this, huh? The, the, yeah. Yeah, so you, yeah, you see, so, yeah. no, you you know, when you get closer to the to the actual size of the operator, you, you get large cut of effects, as expected, yeah, again. But in principle, once you have an extrapolated, continuous extrapolated points, yes. let's make them red. Yes. Then you fit a, a polynomial of sorts through these points to go down to t equals zero. That's right. right. Okay. Yeah, I start with a constant, then a linear. Yeah, then yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. And the, the linear might have a lot of corrections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's that's how we do it. Uh, you can also you can also do a global fit, right? yeah. including cut of effects and t yeah. dependence. So this is very good. So nobody have done this. Before, no, right? but in fact, uh, I get x to the five. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So this is the these are the unmatched results again. Okay, and these are the match results, and you see that you know we these these moments are supposed to be very very small. We know that we know that going to larger n, this becomes becomes smaller and smaller. But here again, you see almost no. Here I would I could do a constant fit between the, you know in these in these data points. And again, keep in mind that we have a statistic of 200. If we go, again, if we reduce this by a factor of three or four, uh, I think there is little doubt that we should be able to get to x to the five. And uh, in fact, the goal is to get to x to the six. And once we get to x to the six, then we should be rather confident that the reconstruction of PDF is very precise. Yeah. Okay. And again, you see, this is now the size of the, of the operator. The operator becomes bigger and bigger because you have more and more derivatives. Okay, so uh, I finished just a slide on the potential systematics of this calculation because I just discussed, well, we discussed a little bit of systematics, but mainly the statistical uncertainties. Uh, so one uh, potential systematics is the, is the fact that the matching is done in perturbation theory. Okay, so if you take, if you take these ratios like I showed you and you calculate these matching coefficients, uh, you can plot them. Here I plot them n divided by n minus one, but you can do the same plot uh, depending on what kind of uh, operator, what kind of moment you choose. Huh? Uh, then you see that uh, these objects actually have a, uh, have a rather smooth dependence in the flow time. This is uh, plotted as a function of square root of at because it gives you an idea of, uh, of the size. Uh, uh, you, know, you, can, you can compare with the size of the operator. But nevertheless, the uncertainty between this correction factor and one, which is a three level, is always below 10%. And so my expectation is that if one goes to next to next reading order, the correction should not be very large unless this particular scheme is particularly bad. And we have seen this before, you choose a scheme and then in the end the two-loop correction becomes very large, you do not, you cannot predict that. But in principle, the indication is that the correction should be small. Uh, one thing I should say is that these matching coefficients, which I shown earlier, this one here, in fact satisfy an RG equation. And this is the solution of the RG equation, and this is what they are plotted here. So all the leading logs have been resumed in this, in this plot. Okay. 
you have finite volume effects uh, because, uh, as I said, the final lattice space in this object have a finite extension. Okay, but you know, imagine that you 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 go up to ten ten derivatives. You will never go there, but let's say ten derivatives. Uh, you know, because the lattice is 48 cubes times 96, it's still large enough to contain the operator. So we don't, I don't expect large finite size effects because of that. You have seen first signs of discretization errors if the flow time is too small. Okay, so you better have a, you better have a flow time radius which is larger, let's say, of the size of the operator. That's important. Okay, to avoid cutoff effects. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Actually. Okay. And so, what's the outlook of this? Uh, of this is uh, first we want to do the continuum limit of the plots I just showed you, and try to calculate up to x to the six, and do a first reconstruction of the PDF for the volume. That's exercise number one. We're almost there. Uh, yeah, so sure. When you look at the, you're looking at only the four, 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 four operator. Yeah, that's right. So if you look at ten, is no, we are not going to do that. We'll stop at six. Most likely, there should be enough. <laughs> but keep in mind that nobody has ever done this up to exclusion. Yeah, sure. so yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. But we will stop at six, yeah. So x to, x to the six is six derivatives. Yeah. I mean, if you compare people using quasi-PDF or pseudo-PDF, they, they need a finite, a physical finite extent uh, uh, product of gauge links, which is at least 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.1 Fermi. So they're even larger than these. Five derivatives. What's that? Five derivatives. Five? Five, five derivatives. derivatives. Right. No, no, no. If you if you choose if you do quasi PDF or pseudo PDF, uh, the physical distance between the Wilson line has to keep. You have to keep it constant with the continuum limit. Otherwise, that's not a PDF anymore. Oh yeah, which is meant when x six equals five derivatives. Uh, uh, no, no. X six is six derivatives. No, average x. No, average x is gamma mu d mu one derivative. X squared is gamma mu d mu. You have, you have one gamma. You have seven indices, but one gamma. Sure, that's why. Uh, so x six is six derivatives and one gamma. So seven indices. Sure. X squared is one derivative. Two. Oh, sorry. X is sorry. I got it wrong. X X. It's for the second one. You're right. You're right. Sorry. X. <laughs> You're right. And so X is one derivative. If I add the second derivative, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, then I get X squared. X squared. Yeah. Just a convention. People call it second moment. Second moment. That's right. So when, when, I was a, X when I was a student, that convention was going me crazy. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so x to the six is six there. Yeah. <laughs> so that that would be the seventh moment. Yeah, seventh moment. that's right. Yeah. Okay, so once we have that, we can reconstruct uh, the full PDF, and then uh, and then uh, you know once this uh, exercise is done, and uh, you know the numerical results we're obtaining are way beyond my wildest uh, optimism. So <laughs> I, I think I think I think that we are really doing something interesting here. And, uh, and so we want to move to the nucleon. Then, of course, for the nucleon matrix elements, will be the two, two, two problems we need to solve. One is the intrinsic noise to signal of these correlators because of the nucleon, and also because in that case, we might have large excited state contaminations when we go towards a physical point. And then, of course, maybe the, 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 holy, the, the holy grade 1.0 will be to do the singlet, so to, to reconstruct the dual. Okay. Uh, in, in the, in, so, okay. This and also the extension to the loop will be important to control one of the systematic of this type of uh, calculation. And I don't have to tell you that there are many other potential applications for this with, with this method. You know, this method can be generalized for GPD, for example. It's not this. Okay, so let me summarize. Oh, I made it on time, I think. Okay, so we have a new method to calculate moments of any order of part of distribution functions from lattice QCD. The method is general. It can be used with any lattice action. In fact, I've been approached by several groups uh, that want to understand how this method works because they want to use this method, not only, uh, not only us. Um, the idea is to make use of an intermediate regulator, which is the gradient flow, that simplifies the continuum limit. And after you have done the continuum limit and you have recovered, a you have, you have recovered a continuum symmetry, then, then you can use the continuum symmetry to let you do the matching in continuum perturbation theory, choosing this uh, the reps of all four and traceless uh, matrix uh, uh, traceless fields, and uh, an extra very good, uh, very very important advantage is that the matrix elements now can be all calculated with vanishing external momenta, so you don't need to inject any. So you will have a, a twofold gain in terms of uh, of noise to signal. One is because you use the flow that cuts off the short distance fluctuations, and also because you don't have to inject any momentum in the calculation. Uh, as and then. Uh, we observed that these ratios of matrix elements further improve both the continuum limit and the signal-to-noise, calculating ratios of moments. 
and uh, and so all in all, uh, we believe that this is a, is a is a is a promising is a promising way to to study stru atom structure. Of, uh, yeah, atom structure. Yeah. Thank you. Further questions? Online questions too, if there's any. Very nice result. Beautiful. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want to agree with you. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, just nice. Uh, so, of course, to, to your last point, uh, the ratio, do you have separate results without ratio? We are working on this. So, there are two ways to do this. Uh, one is, uh, okay, so. Uh, Maybe I go here. Okay. Uh, okay. So one way would be to actually implement uh, on the lattice numerically the same scheme I've used in perturbation theory. So namely, normalize these, correlator, these correlation functions with B slash. Okay. And this again is something you can do for any n. So you could repeat the same exercise I've shown you here, but instead of normalizing by average x, you normalize by D slash, also average x, and you can calculate them all. You don't need the normalizer. Okay. But uh, we haven't finished the calculation of this slash yet, so we have to test this. Okay, but in principle, there will be a way to directly calculate average x. Huh? I I do believe that to calculate all the higher moments, these ratios are better because there are there are lots of cancellations in this ratio. Right. Right. But but in principle, one can cal calculate directly average x using this slash. Huh? But of course, another way would be to calculate average x using standard methods like Aramov schemes. That's what's uh, being tested right now, and. Uh, and then uh, at, at that point, you have average x coming from uh, from RM on to MS bar okay. matching. Okay. And then and then you input that in the in the ratios. But keep in mind, the RM on, you can only use it then again for the first few moments mainly, OK? While the, the normalization with this slash, you can use it for any moment. But we just, yeah, we just find that, uh, I mean, as I said, we don't have the data for this slash yet. So the calculation is not uh, complicated, it's just uh, we have to calculate this expectation value, okay? So we, we have this expectation value, but we don't have it for all the flow times. We don't have it for, we don't have the same kind of data for, for all the ensembles. Uh, but we will compare, we will compare average X, at least average X will compare between D slash and RMO. Yeah, but then for the higher moments, I think these ratios are better. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. And also you can have different combinations of the ratios, right? Not just uh, three over one. No, uh, three or two. Yeah, I have that actually. But not, I didn't leave a plot with the new data, but I think I have it for the old data. Let me check. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So you can have all different combinations. Yeah. But you, because x squared is noisier than x, uh, you are actually adding noises without, with, and you don't get really anything. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. just a just sign moment. Maybe some sort of check or calculation, but no, yeah. But you see, I mean, the same the same behavior also for x squared over uh, x cube over x squared. Yeah. Yeah. Here, I you you have to take into account only the yellow points. The yellow points is the finest lattice spacing. Yeah. But this this is this is also the old uh, this is an older statistic. So these points are obtained with uh, just twenty two gauges. Oh, I see. So, <laughs> so I haven't I haven't plotted them with the uh, with the new statistics. So. <clears throat> okay, so Andrew, I have now the looking forward question. So I, I still remember when 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 Shandong proposed a positive PDF, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for the leading order match in the can you meet it, got it, right? It's like one page in the duration. But it took then like 10 years to get to look. <laughs> mm. For no. your case, maybe no. less. No. Because but. I think you don't have, you, you're basically doing no cooperator matching, so I think it should be easier. This is really, this is uh, state of the art, uh, even, yeah. So this, you, we have to solve this matching equations to two loops. So yeah. you have to extend this two loops. This is, I mean, you have. It's no cooperator. Yeah, yeah. So the PDF is like a final. No, no. This is lo this is all done in a continuum. Huh? You you do this in dimensional regularization, in the, and then you 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 do MS or MS bar when you subtract the poles. Yeah. And uh, if, as a matter of fact. On the left hand side, the UV is, is regulated by the flow, is the is the IR that you regulate in the in the work. Uh, but um, yeah, the extension of this type of calculation to, to loops exists uh, for other for, for exists for, for, for framing operators, exists for 
So by link, they exist already. The technology is already there. Okay. Okay. You just have to borrow the assets for, for your buffers. Yeah. 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 The the thing is that you need to generate. You have to find what you need is to define some projectors here for generic n. I think that would be the most difficult task to do the calculation. But once you have the projectors for generic n, then you can do it automatic, almost automatically. Okay. So what's your expectation uh, for the two loop extension to this? Huh? Yeah. I want to do it. Yeah. Very good. It's very nice. I mean, then you can do systematic, right? You can say what kind of uh, uncertainty is there really concerning from the weight part, matching part. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, you have seen you have seen that the effect of the matching is not very big, even at this order, right? So yeah, yeah. you see, I mean, this is the effect. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there is something, but <laughs> you sorry, Matt. I have a naive question. Oh. It's actually on the page for introduction. Uh, page four. The, oh, yeah, uh, page for the different methods. I just got a little bit confused. Uh, for the Hadron tensor in 2019, is that by Jian Liang or, uh, or Lian? I'm not I, sure. I, I, I might have. <laughs> Did I quote the wrong? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, the Hadron tensor method. I, is, this, is this wrong? I thought maybe by Jian or Liang or. Yeah. But this is Liang, right? Or do I do it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I thought, yeah. And also, I thought it may be the same as a hadron. That's the same as number one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a, it's, a, it's a sort of a repetition of this one. That's it's my understanding. Miracle, miracle implementation. It's just, it's a, it's a same, similar thing, right? This is you, it's right? It's the same. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay, so this should be the same method, right? <laughs> so you want me to, sorry, you want me to remove this? Or? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. I just uh, <laughs> make sure they're actually uh, degenerate. Yeah, okay. Uh, I thought yeah, there was okay. uh, another maybe, method. Maybe I'll put Leon underneath here yeah. and then, uh, okay. All right, thank yeah. you. Yeah. That was the primary motivation for the hadronic tensor. First one is to get the I mean, if anybody DIS, has... but so far we have don't have a manpower yet to calculate. <laughs> Right. If, no, if anybody asks me to make a review, I'll do a better job. Yeah. Okay.